for the nice introduction. Okay, uh, sorry, controls are being a bit slow. Right, so so this is titled Reasoning About Complex, Me Complex Media from Weak Multimodal Supervision. And it's talk is, is a little bit about the former, about reasoning about media and mostly using it as, as inspiration for some of the more mainstream uh, work that I'm also doing, which has to do with, with weak supervision and multimodal supervision. So, but um, the motivation for all of that work uh, really came from wanting to analyze media content uh, because media content affects public opinions and societal outcomes like through elections. Um, so we want to understand the agenda and the intent of these media. media. Uh, originally, we were working on visual advertisements. More recently, we've, we've looked at um, images and texts and pol political articles. And um, the, you know, it's not like this sounds like an easy task, but more specifically, some of the challenges uh, lie in the fact that data is limited and also supervision may be noisy. So for example, images that have intent, like say ads, are not as abundant as images of, you know, people, uh, as, as images people take of their cats and dogs and just general images that they, uh, that they take every day. They're, um, they require a lot of human knowledge uh, to understand and it's expensive and feasible to carefully annotate all of this uh, knowledge. And I think that's where some of our uh, labs is, you know, research interests overlap. Um, how to deal with challenges like that. Um, you know, on the vision language end, there, there's supervision in the form of text that helps disambiguate what the images might be trying to say. But the relation between the images and text is often, in these domains, indirect um, and abstract and complementary, um, unlike in the, in the more standard caption case. So the relation between the images and text is more complex here. Uh, but still, even though the, the supervision we have is more challenging and more noisy, we still want to be able to learn some useful models. And we're able to do that in both the media domain as well as more general uh, computer vision tasks. But starting off with, with some motivation, so uh, visual motivation, so the media shapes opinions. I guess I'm not going to spend too much time convincing you of that. The top two, I guess uh, pretty much all of us are too young to have seen uh, definitely the first one, which is from the 60s, and possibly the second one, which is from the 90s. But they're said to have uh, been influential. These are just some quotes that people uh, said, whether the author or other people about these photographs. Um, and what we've been focusing on has been uh, ads, at least in the first part of the talk, and some, some part of the talk. Um, and ads are, you know, not always, don't always work in direct and obvious ways. They kind of change the way you think about things over time, and it's very subtle to, um, to measure. But there's several campaigns that, you know, can quantifiably uh, be, be shown to have affected uh, people's habits and people's, you know, buying behaviors and so on. Um, and what's more interesting is that a lot of them are very, very creative from all kinds of uh, points of view. And this is just an example of the, the this absolute campaign, which is you've probably seen. Um, these from a computer vision perspective are very challenging. Um, you know, why is this absolute Chicago? This one in the middle here. Or, I don't know, why is this absolute New York? Why is this absolute appeal? Um, actually, I'm more curious about why the, the upper right, uh, upper um, um, top image saying I killed the general. Yeah, so this is, um, mm -hmm. so this is something that the, the author said, uh, his name is Eddie Adams, and he got a Pulitzer Prize for this photograph. It actually does show a uh, South Vietnamese uh, general killing a member of the Viet Cong and, you know, literally shows a killing, which is a little bit morbid, but uh -huh. um, because of how this was perceived and how this, you know, how this affected the perception of this general who was, I guess, I famous, see. Um, I see, I see. you know, this was a highly influential photograph yeah. and Eddie Adams got a Pulitzer Prize, but then he kind of, you know, mm -hmm. in some sense regretted this photograph um, later on mm -hmm. because it killed the general's not only career, but, you know, kind of pushed him in a, in a corner. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Makes sense. 
And of course, oh, there's I... not there's not that many photographs that are that influential, but a lot of photographs we see are at least memorable in, in the media. Right. Um, and, and I the think that of... the other two that you are referring to is really cultural dependent, right? Sure. Talking about Chicago and all that. There must be a huge amount of background information. Sure, right, right. And I think that's that's very that. Yeah, that's very interesting. I guess for, for Chicago, you know, I, I was I was at some point hoping that having a knowledge base would help in these tasks. And and unfortunately, we haven't had a lot of progress. I mean, we did do something with knowledge bases, but I was really very hopeful about knowledge bases. Um, also, because they have this kind of AI, classic AI flavor, but we struggle with them and other people have struggled. I know your group has maybe been more successful. So maybe you can uh, tell us how you've been more successful, but um, yeah, so I guess here I'm hoping that that uh, people know that Chicago is windy and these letters are being blown in the wind. So of course, from a knowledge representation perspective and from a vision perspective, that's that's really hard. Um, so one task we formulate is this ad decoding challenge where uh, we say that state of the art vision systems are inadequate to describe the messages hidden behind purposefully constructed ads. So for example, for this ad, uh, vision systems are great, and this is actually, you know, four years old at this point, um, these outputs that I have here, but in terms of image captioning, it is correct, according to what the model knows, uh, a model, sta a man standing in front of a display of food, a man standing in front of a display of a store, the concepts are correct, but the point of the ad, what it means, is more about food at Burger King must taste really good, since even the competitor's employee secretly buys it, which is this Ronald McDonald, and again, culturally dependent. Um, and it's, he's secretly buying it because he's wearing this trench coat. And I guess in at least some cultures, wearing a trench coat is, is seen as you're being, trying to be stealthy or something. Um, so some challenges, there's some purely visual challenges in being able to understand what these ads mean. There's, uh, sorry, let me hide my controls, but I hit them. Um, this is a deer made of made out of junk, uh, but of course the texture of the deer is very different. This is, you know, a, an owl made out of beans. These are lungs made out of trees. This is a cow made out of fruit. Um, and generally, vision systems will have uh, trouble recognizing these objects here because they're not, you know, they don't look photorealistic. So I have uh, one grant that um, that's kind of recent that that focuses on developing domain robust representations. Um, so this has to do with domain adaptation and generalization, but also um, approaching it from a kind of a complementary angle, trying to look at shape and context as allowing domain robustness. There's also, this is something we haven't tackled as much, um, but there's also challenges due to uh, these ads portraying physical processes, dynamic processes, even though they're they're static ads, and being able to kind of hallucinate this process allows you to understand the ad. So here, there's melting. This is one that I really like. Um, basically, uh, this is about. I think that the text says every 60 seconds a species dies out. So this is very clever ad that shows you the you know presumably the the arms of the clock will keep advancing, and when they advance, this bear will be crushed. So metaphorically, it will be killed. Um, this is showing you a man's boot crushing a woman's sandal. So this is something about domestic violence. Um, there's human associations, which we call symbols, like this man is fragile, like China is fragile. This, uh, you know, smoking is as dangerous as, as a bullet. Um, this is kind of a, a double pun because it's it's showing you oven mitts are used to handle hot stuff, but it's hot like the spice, not hot like the temperature. Uh, there's there's complex usage of language and complex relations between images and and text. So both of these ads say uh, winter winter collection, but obviously this is not really a typical winter collection ad. It's not a fashion ad. This is a commercial ad for premium women's clothing, but this is actually a public service announcement against human human trafficking. Something about, I guess, if you traffic people, they you know they don't have an identity, they don't have freedom to to run away. Um, so it's a very you know powerful ad that I think assumes we've seen ads like this with the same text, but the the text has new meaning. Um, so to tackle some of these challenges in order to be able to decode ads and decode what they mean, uh, of course, we first collected a large data set, um, which is labeled with these categories like topics, sentiments, what we call these action arena statements. 
uh, which is what you should do according to the add and why, and I'll have more on this later. We have some other annotations that we've done less with. We have a companion video data set, which is smaller, but has more or less the same uh, types of annotations. So the, the decoding add task is formulated as uh, trying to predict a statement, like uh, what message does the ad convey, which we call the action, and what arguments does it provide for taking the suggested action, which we call the reason. Because of the variability in how humans uh, provide these annotations, uh, this is not really new, uh, but to, to deal with the challenge, we formulate this as a multiple choice task um, where the system is given K options for action reason statement and, and it needs to pick the one that matches the image. So just to give you an example of what we have on the data set for this image, which is actually on the simpler e uh, end with this man wearing a, a shirt that shows him as a baby and this is a, a water brand. Um, the correct action reason statements are, I should drink Evian because it helps you recover. I should buy Evian because it keeps us young. I should drink Evian because it will keep me like a baby. So this is the action part. And then we have the reason part. And this can be very complex. Um, so one example method we have, which is a metric learning approach that tries to uh, embed the representation for an image close to the representation for the corresponding action reason statement like this. So for this image, uh, we, wanted to, we want to produce this uh, action reason statement, so retrieve it rather. I should be careful on the road so I don't crash and die. Rather than this statement, I should buy this motorbike because it's fast. And the way we represent the image is just is a combination of a bunch of stuff. Um, one is just standard image regions with some attention. Um, in, we have several papers where we were not trying to read the text in the image because in some cases, this text is very close to the, um, the final output because of how humans you know, operate. So, so this and what the, the slogan of the essays are not the same. And in a lot of cases, they're different, but in some cases they're similar. However, in this method, um, we wanted to use that slogan. And so the slogan in this ad is read the road and you won't need as many new parts and it shows you this crash motorcycle. Then we have some way of handling symbols, which I'm not too happy with, but it was, a, it was an initial step, which is that we train these classifiers for symbols uh, like danger and nature, technology, and so on. And then because we don't have object annotations on this data set, we wanted to kind of transfer knowledge from a dense captioning method. And so we get predictions for what the um, local regions in this image might portray. Uh, this is an ad about kind of the symbols that we have in the data set. So we have, and these are all human annotated. But we have symbols for danger, nature, health, strength, speed, energy. So for example, for strength, you have like people flexing their muscles. For speed, you have either, um, there's, there's some bullets, there's some rockets, motion blur. For health, you have things like tomatoes, um, various, various fruit and so on. So, these are some, some example results based, based on both image and text features, meaning both uh, visual regions and, and slogan inputs. So the if you just use the slogan versus just use the image, uh, I should probably say what this is showing. So this is accuracy of retrieving action reason statements for uh, product ads versus public service announcements, which the PSAs, first of all, are fewer in count and that are much more creative. So they're, they're really hard. So here, higher is better. Here, lower is better. So this is rank of the uh, of a correct statement. So if you just look at image only versus slogan only, um, the slogan gives you more information than the image alone. But then um, if you combine image and text and some of our symbols, you get uh, an improved result. Um, predicting reason as opposed to predicting action is more challenging. So now in this type of table, lower is better. And uh, basically, predicting action and reason is the easiest because I guess it's a longer statement. It's very, it's more specific. Followed by action, followed by reason. And on video, we did the same thing. Um, but it so in video, we don't have slogans, but we have speech. And it turns out that speech is not as useful as slogans in, in images, in the sense that um, if you just capture the speech, you get lower results if you just capture the, the visual information from the frames. Here's a cherry picked but intuitive result, um, which shows at that point what we were using as a baseline is just some join embedding method which was trained on our data set. That's this baseline. So this is the statement that it picks. This is a statement that our method picks. The green regions are uh, regions of importance 
you know, regions of interest that are obtained for training from training on our data set. Um, and basically what it shows you is this uh, woman is putting on lipstick, but the lipstick is actually a cigarette butt. And uh, the, the correct statement is I should stop smoking because it doesn't make me pretty. The incorrect statement is I should wear Revlon makeup because it will make me more attractive. And actually, um, you know, this is, this does seem relevant, um, but the model looks like it's not examining the image very carefully because on the surface, it does look like a beauty ad. However, it's, it's not. Um, so next we wanted to do the intuitive thing, which is to try to bring in some external information from an external knowledge base. You know, at the time we weren't so much into uh, like unsupervised pre-training. We could do that. We still haven't done that very much on for, for testing on our as data set, but you could. What we were doing is the more classic thing of, um, of using facts from a knowledge base. So we had these visual regions. We had, we did OCR on the slogans. We use the slogans to query a knowledge base. Um, and we got some knowledge entries. And these knowledge entries, unsurprisingly, are not um, all relevant. So this is a Nike ad. This is the slogan in the ad. It says, introducing the Nike Hyperdome July 26. These are the three knowledge pieces we retrieve. Nike is an American sportswear and apparel company. Nike is a sizable asteroid. Uh, Nike, the Greek goddess. So we have some way of, um, of the model selecting which of these are, are relevant. Um, but it turns out that the way that the task is formulated, it just ends up ignoring pretty much all of these uh, knowledge pieces, even though intuitively they should be helpful. So now you could say, well, they're not helpful if all the information you need is contained in the model, in the, in the data set, in the as data set. But it's also that the way we formulated the task allows the method to cheat at least on some of the categories. So um, this is showing you we have a graph that combines information from the visual regions, a slogan, and the knowledge pieces. Um, this we call a sentinel node that basically represents the image, and this image should, should be projected close to this action reason statement. Um, I should buy Nike sneakers because they protect my feet. And unsurprisingly, what happens is that um, depending on how we formulate the multiple choice task and depending on what the randomly sampled negatives are, the model can just learn to match Nike in the input, which is a slogan, and Nike in the desired output, which is, you know, here, um, which we call shortcuts. And they, you know, depending on what the data looks like, how commonly we have these popular brands like Nike versus more, uh, more rare brands, um, you know, this behavior of, of relying on shortcuts may be, uh, may or may not be um, rewarded uh, but you know, if you have a more rare brand, then you really need to reason about what properties are being shown in this image. Whereas in this case, you just need to do this, you can just do this shallow matching of, of slogans to, to apples. In general, what we're hoping is that because you actually need to reason about, okay, this image is showing you some sort of athleticism, um, it would be helpful to query a knowledge base and find out information about you know, shoes are used by athletes and you know these kinds of shoes are used by athletes and so on. But it turns out if the model can do something simpler, which is match Nike to my, Nike, that's what it's gonna do. Um, so to prevent over, overfitting through these shortcuts, we randomly mask parts of our training samples. Uh, so we have three ways of masking that are not especially interesting, but they do, um, they do help performance on at least one task that we formulate. Um, so the way our graph works, before I get to the masking and the results, the way um, our graph works is we have these uh, slogan nodes. So the slogan nodes um, convey some original meaning from some standard word embedding model, as well as information from the knowledge base, which is denoted by this, these variables key here. Uh, so the J's are neighbors, or, or, or knowledge pieces are retrieved for the ith slogan, uh, and the alphas are weights, are edge weights that the model can uh, can control. Um, then we also have a global node, which uses the um, information from the slogans, as well as the visual regions that are called B. And now we have these betas that are learnable edge weights, um, and they allow, the alphas and the betas allow the model to choose what knowledge to use. However, what we show is that even though the model can choose which knowledge pieces are relevant and which knowledge pieces to use, it's just gonna end up like not using very much uh, information from the knowledge base. Um, so we discover that if you do some sort of random masking of the training data, not, in, not like dropout, but basically masking tokens, 
Um, this prevents the model from relying too much on word matching or object matching. Um, and so we have three strategies. One, where we randomly drop detected uh, textual slogans. One where we mask knowledge-based query words. One where we mask Wikipedia queries. Um, and we did all of that when we started working on this. This was kind of before masking in the bird sense was was popular. So we kind of stumbled upon this idea on, on our own. Um, and what we show here is so we have a graph that's learned without masking and one that's learned with masking. And basically the one that's so so what this is showing you is the yellow is a global representation of the image. We have visual regions. The blue stuff is parts of the slogan, and then the orange stuff is parts from a knowledge base. The uh, thickness of the connections is how, um, how, how important that piece is for the full image representation. And so basically without masking, the model is really not using much from the knowledge base at all. Uh, with masking, it is using information from the knowledge base and, and the pieces it chooses are relevant. So this is a more kind of conventional commercial ad. I should buy Chanel because I'll be fashionable. And so it looks up information about Chanel, the company. This is a PSA about protecting the environment. And these are the, the action reason statements. I should recycle because it will ultimately affect our environment. I should recycle because nature cannot. I should recycle because garbage can harm animals. Uh, the slogan is uh, nature can be, uh, rubbish can be recycled, nature cannot. So it looks up information about, the model looks up information about recycling and about nature. And this is a qualitative example, but quantitatively, one thing we wanted to measure is if the model does retrieve some uh, knowledge pieces, some nuggets from the knowledge base, how often are they correct according to a very small evaluation set we collected? And with masking, the model is much more correct, like over 100% more correct than when, than when we don't use masking. So masking allows the model to select uh, much more relevant information from the knowledge base. Uh, quantitatively on now, not on the knowledge selection task, but on the action reason retrieval task, we outperform prior methods, some of which are ours, others are not. Um, this is more of an ablation result where we have uh, visual and textual information, such so as image and slogan, visual, textual, and knowledge pieces, but no masking. And then the third row in each of these settings is with our three forms of masking. And the bolded results are the the best one is in that setting. So generally we don't get on this task, we don't get a huge boost in performance. In some cases we do, for example, here, when you compare, basically if you, so here lower is better in this because it's, it's rank. Um, so when you add knowledge, it pretty much doesn't help you. Um, but if you do knowledge with masking, now this 25.1 is much better, much lower than the 30.1. Um, so, but our conclusion was knowledge base information can help, but you have to make sure that the model can't just more easily cheat. And since then, we've extended this to the um, to other more common data sets like this VCR data set where we um, show that again, the task is formulated in such a way that there's an easy way for the model to cheat. Like um, on this image, which one of them is person, so this is person one, this is person two. Uh, the question is, what does person one think of person two's dress? The correct answer is person one thinks person two's dress looks looks stunning in her dress. And you can see that, you know, the correct answer actually has the most, you know, string overlap with the most number of overlapping words with the question, which is, of course, going to be something the model picks up on. We show that when you, when you do these, uh, what seem like meaningless shallow changes to the answer options um, that really tricks the model into producing the, the wrong responses. Um, and some of, you know, it, we argue that meaning is not very much changed by these silly ch shallow changes we make. Of course, meaning is changed a little bit, but it still shouldn't be changed very much. And we show that the, you know, it, it does affect the model quite a bit. So here we have the original validation data with the correct option and incorrect op options. Um, if we replace two, so this is asking where's two going and the answer is two is going to the store. If we replace two with he, um, he's going to the store and the model all of a sudden decides to pick he's going to the bathroom, even though that none of this implies bathroom. Now you could say two is getting into a carriage would be plausible, but that's not what the model picks. It picks two is going to the bathroom, even though, you know. Uh, so, so this change of two to he shouldn't really have changed the model's um, 
choices that much. So the way we deal with uh, this fragility of the models is again by masking. And what we show is that if you do masking on a curriculum as opposed to the standard BERT or MLM, uh, actually, so we have masking and we have masking plus mass language modeling, but um, all of the kind of static masking is a little bit worse than our curriculum based masking where what we do is we mask more at first, more of the input at first to kind of force the model to not just look at these, these shortcuts and just kind of looking at one word overlapping between different models, but to look at a broader set of evidence. And then we reduce the amount of masking to make the distribution on the training set closer to the test distribution. And we see that that works the best. Um, even more recently, we've looked at, uh, so the, Two of the things I'm interested in is domain annotation and VQA. And so we decided to kind of merge this. There's, there's two prior works, one very recent, one a little bit older that does something similar. We just do it at a larger scale with more recent VQA models with a new domain annotation technique um, and with more data sets. But basically we wanted to see how easy, um, and of course no one expects it to be easy, but how feasible it is to transfer VQA models trained on one data set to another data set. Um, even though they they both th these data sets both look visually different oftentimes and or the way the questions are uh, are asked is different either at a semantic level or at a synt syntactic level which actually makes a difference um, this is just an example from from the paper where we sh we we have a lot of these experiments some of them we have a synthetic setting some of them we have a meaning we, we create synthetic shifts um, this is with real data sets and we're comparing two models and the results are kind of what you would expect, but we see interesting correlations between um, types of, so for example, we find that GQA is, uh, so, so what, what we see here is that GQA and, uh, and VQA play nicer together than some other uh, pairs of data sets. And that's because GQA is compared to other data set pairs is in terms of the questions, more semantically similar, syntactically not so similar to VQA, but we find that that the semantic similarity is okay, uh, is is important. Um, and we so we have this analysis of how different are these data sets, uh, both both in terms of images and questions, how different are they at a high level and low level, like semantics versus syntax, and how does this affect performance? Meaning how well um, a model trained on one data set transfers to to others. And some of the results we, we see are not so surprising, like clever is not a good model to train on and expect it would generalize to others. But some of the other results are a little bit more surprising. We also have this method for um, kind of inspired by neurosymbolic VQA techniques where we try to try to. So our intuition for neurosymbolic methods is that they should be more domain robust because they separate perception from reasoning and the reasoning is a part that should generalize well. So if you just have to redo the perception part to train on a different data set, that should be more feasible than retraining the whole model. Um, so here we have this domain adaptation technique that basically tries to bridge domains just in terms of the uh, perception part uh, rather than training jointly the perception and the VQA part. But I don't really care to get into the details unless someone really cares. Um, and I guess I didn't say it's it's okay to to stop me, so I'll pause yeah, here. And Jenna, questions. sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, I'm also wondering if if it's okay for us to interact with you because it's delivering yes, over I should Zoom. Have said that. And and a lot of the materials that you are presenting, I think it will benefit from interacting with the audience because yes. because yeah. our understanding of the uh, ads and all that is different. Sure. So, yeah. Let's let's. Hopefully, you can see this not in full screen now. So let me know. Right. Let's just talk about any of this. Right. Um, maybe I'll start um, uh, with one question. Oh, maybe more more of uh, seeking comments from your side. Um, when you are working with the you know advertisements related QA as well as reasoning aspect, um, have you ever got chances to chat with the you know the, the advertisement? Uh, industry people, or um, um, to me, the understanding of all this advertisement, there are multiple layers of understanding, very, 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 you know, um, ground layer is you, you, you recognize, okay, there is a Pepsi uh, can, then there's multiple uh, straws, um, 
at that at that level, and then you start to 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 think and infer, saying maybe that um, PSA is indicating the waste of you know plastic uh, materials, which will um, pollute the environment. If I'm understanding this um, PSA correctly, right? Oh, so this one is actually, I think. Um... My reading is different, which is that these straws are uh, striving towards the can, that they uh -huh. want to drink the co Coke or the Pepsi. Uh -huh. um, so to answer your first, uh, I definitely think there's layers of understanding. Um, I mean, we have one of the methods is basically doing some sort of object recognition first. And um, yeah, we don't have, I guess we don't have anything where we, up, on the ads, at least, we don't have anything that really abstracts away the per perception from the reasoning part. Uh, mm -hmm. I think mostly because we ran out of steam on on working on ads because we, we did a lot several papers and and we kind of used up I think all of our ideas that we that we thought would work. Um, but as far as using the uh, talking to ad designers, we haven't, and that's a very common question. The reason we haven't is because I think whatever they tell us wouldn't actually help us that much. So I uh -huh. have a media studies degree in college as well. And I have a bunch mm -hmm. of like advertising books and I tried, um, I mean, one of them pretty much describes these strategies that ads use to construct media, like ju juxtaposition and all the and contrast and so on and so forth. We actually did annotate them on, so we had non-experts annotate them, but we had a lot of training um, on mm -hmm. our data set and it wasn't really something we could we could model. So I think just there's a purely AI component that that's going to make whatever ad designers tell us not usable yet. That that was kind of a decision we made a while back. So nowadays, the, a lot of things in AI have become more advanced. Maybe it's a good time to revisit um, mm -hmm. talking to an ad designer. But yeah, yeah, it, it, it's so interesting, right? Um, um, in a sense that um, people are more focusing on natural images as if we are, you know, dealing with intelligent agents and we are thinking intelligent agents are more uh, going to interact with uh, natural images kind of inputs. But yeah. while um, at this advertisement level or art level, a lot of these meanings are even beyond natural language description, right? Sometimes if you start describing them, the meaning already starting to alter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was wondering if you guys have any insight that from your experiments to um, show that gap is still fairly wide from recognition and people are vision researchers are focusing on to the meaning level where all this as are trying to express there is i mean there is there is sometimes you, you see a, a piece of art or a piece of as you got this feeling i don't know whether that's common to others you just you, you just don't know right there there's something hits you but you don't know how to describe it yeah <laughs> um, yeah i i think that's really interesting um and it's not Unfortunately, the answer to any of the questions that you asked is, is no, we don't have anything that shows that the gap between like the recognition mm -hmm. aspect and, and how the ad hits you. Um, in fact, I guess when I got interested in this task, it took me a while to figure out how to formulate mm -hmm. understanding an ad and I just came to this essentially VQA setting because everything mm -hmm. else seemed very subjective. Mm -hmm. But I did at some point want to and reach out to um, someone who does kind of not, I don't know if it's called brain imaging, but basically I wanted to, to uh, I don't know, track how people's uh, brains react to these ads. And mm -hmm. that, that's just something that the proposal didn't get funded, so I never pursued it further. Um, I but I think it's, it's very, I've also talked to a political scientist much more recently. Um, mm -hmm. What we're doing there is, I guess, more on the realistic images end. But mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. Um, with what you're saying, I just don't know how to capture that. There's... I, sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just want to mention, as far as I can recall, um, there was a group of people working on, you know, uh, tracking human gaze, gaze behavior. Sure. Um, I don't know whether that might help to pick into the thought process of, 
you know, yeah. a, a standard human being, how they are going to uh, comprehend uh, such a complicated art piece, sometimes complicated, right? Sometimes straightforward uh, uh, art slash advertisement piece. Um, yeah. Just curious. So there about. is, um, there's definitely work on San Lisa. There's also work, um, mm -hmm. I think Zoya Blinsky, um, I think was in, her name at MIT, she was even mm -hmm. um, tracking how people look at kind of posters and not necessarily advertisements, but like banners and, and that kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. We did at some point collect gaze data on about a thousand of these ads. And mm -hmm. we found some interesting stuff. For example, we found that um, where humans look is not necessarily where a saliency model would predict people would look at. For example, mm -hmm. I remember this ad where you have, it was, a, it was a domestic violence ad and it was a man starting to hit a woman. And definitely, you know, people were looking at, I think the victim, which is interesting because they were kind of anticipating what would happen. Um, mm -hmm. the, the man hadn't hit the woman yet, but they were about to hit the woman and people were looking at the, the future victim for, for some mm -hmm. reason. Um, whereas the saliency model was looking somewhere else. I don't remember where it was looking. So I think that's definitely interesting. I think the reason we didn't pursue that is because we didn't trust the data too much because I think there was a lot of variability in where people were looking on these ads. Um, but that was something we were interested in. And I'm very much a fan. I mean, I do have a few other works where we were using gaze as a proxy for like looking mm -hmm. into people's brains. Uh, it's just, yeah, actually now it sounds kind of exciting. Uh, maybe it's, it's a, again, a good time to revisit that. Thanks for the thank suggestion. Oh, yeah, thank you for the, for, for the explanation. I, actually, yeah. we have a, a couple questions yeah. from the chat. Um, and I, I see PJ is also unmuted, uh, if you would like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I had a question about, um, since your task is formulated as a multiple choice uh -huh. um, classification, how did you, um, so what was the strategy for the wrong option? So like, how did you annotate? So we just did random sampling for the negatives. Um, I don't show results on this, but in one case we did random sampling across all the ad, so we have these ad categories. Uh, we have about 40 categories, which we call the topics. So you have like clothing ads, drink ads, whatever. Um, in one setting, the way we're sampling is we were sampling negatives from the, I think the same category. So it, it would all be clothing ads, uh, but just picked from a different image. Um, that's, we did this in one paper, but I think we only did it in one paper, this kind of harder, harder setting. Uh, it's definitely an important point. It, we just haven't pursued it. Like we haven't done a thorough investigation in most of the papers. Okay, thanks. Because uh, as you said in the VCR paper, yep. it seems that, that that high correlation makes it easier for models to answer. And even right. once you know the right answer, it's easier to pick the justification or the reason. But sure. if you if if that's not the first step that you do, then all of those four justifi justifications are equally probable. So right. yeah, yeah. I, so I mean, what we have in in several of the papers is is just re increasing the number of negative options that we have to get a more challenging task. Um, but yeah, I think that's an interesting point that could affect uh, could affect some of the results. I think these shortcuts would still hold even if you um, even if you sample just within the shoe cat or the yeah shoe category. Even if it's um, you know maybe you have to narrow it to just Nike ads, which is a, a subcategory, I guess, and see just within a Nike ad like what the model learns. And probably in that setting, the shortcuts wouldn't be as bad. Um, are there any insights on the external knowledge experiments, like how much knowledge was useful and what VQA questions should have been answered because of the knowledge present? Um, probably, but I don't know off the top of my head if we have any result like that. Um, yeah, because I'm, I was saying that these questions need a lot of knowledge that is not explicitly present in the image, right? So, and yeah. And the, I saw that the knowledge base that you were using was DBPDF. Yeah, it it's it also suffers from the, it doesn't have common sense knowledge as but I think this knowledge needed it goes beyond the common sense part, right? So it would have been interesting like if you found like for few samples like this was correct, but because the knowledge was present and this was even if the knowledge was present, the model was choosing the wrong answer. 
Um, so even if the knowledge was present, the model is choosing the wrong answer. Yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer for that, I guess. Um, I, I don't know if, if that's something. We didn't gen generate, I guess, a lot of qualitative results for this. We pr yeah. I probably have some, some somewhere, but the conclusion was just that the model was basically learning to ignore, um, ig ignore the external knowledge for a lot of cases, or we're just not choosing the right knowledge. But it was not choosing the right knowledge because like essentially all the edge weights were kind of very low. Um, Okay. So it wasn't using much of it. I think that's a very interesting question. I know there's, uh, I definitely know and agree that there's different types of knowledge and DVPDA is one thing and it's not common sense and it would be interesting to com counter common sense. And I know there's other data sets that try to group knowledge into like actually what kind of knowledge it is. Um, but I guess at the time, uh, yeah, we just got a little bit discouraged with how how little gains we were getting, so we didn't pursue this further. Uh, and I guess about that time, my interest kind of started switching. So, so it's a yeah. you know, it's it's a loose thread that you know maybe we'll go back to. Yeah, yeah. The the the, the same kind of situation we encounter at the at the uh, approaching the end of two thousand eighteen. Um, no matter how we mine the end um. Uh, the knowledge from SA WordNet concept net, the, the, the improvement we are observing is really um, just like what you are showing here. And, and yeah. I, we totally with you um, in this aspect. Um, that's why our research kind of also shift towards how to utilize external knowledge to distill into the end-to-end -end training model instead of doing the reasoning at, at, as a, as a, as a you know, second step or second um, um, uh, module to improve. However, yeah. I, I, we are just speculating from the empirical results. Um, not sure whether it's because of, you know, the training data wise or, 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 or it's because the reliability of the knowledge base that we are mm -hmm. using. Um, um, I, I agree with you. We are faced. We are experiencing similar kind of, um, um, I, I call it glass roof for incorporating yeah. some knowledge. Uh, yeah. some, some kind of like like roof that we are hitting. We know uh, it's useful, but doesn't seem to be getting us enough performance boost. I don't know whether there's any, any other comments from the students or from the audience along this um, line as well. Yeah, I'd love to hear them if there are. There yeah, is so one more chat. Oh, no, that's from Katya. Mm. Okay. Yeah, sorry, uh, I interrupted. Uh, Pratya, you would like to say something? Yeah, so what from our experience of using knowledge is that if the knowledge is has a little bit of word overlap, but is not useful and it leads to a wrong path of a wrong answer, the systems will go down that path. So, mm. and so that's why knowledge is not like bringing knowledge is a two phase sort. Like you can actually make a bad model because you are using a knowledge. And if you do, are not careful on how to select the knowledge, it will actually reduce the model's performance. Mm -hmm. And we also have observed, like in, at least in the science and other QS, that the, the how good the knowledge source is that actually affects the reasoning. So, like if you have a large, like so in science QA, we have huge, huge knowledge corpuses available, but they contain all kinds of information that right? might be distracting. So, right. so I'm like DVPedia. I mean, I, I don't think DVPedia has such information like those beer reasoning about the crushing of the beer or the lungs and the trees. No. So, so those kind of info. So they will have trees in beers mentioned, but they will never have that in like it. And I was also curious, like if we give those information to a human, if and just say that just looking at this piece of information and the image, can you reason about it? I think uh, a, a human also will not be able to answer such questions, right? So yeah. So, so the... yeah, at one point, what I wanted to do is create a knowledge base. I think the knowledge you need is more like cultural knowledge, like from watching mm -hmm. movies and the kind of associations that you might expect from that. And I did at one point write a, an unsuccessful proposal about that. And it was just 
it's kind of too hard. Um, yeah. I like that. Um, so she Fu Ching at Columbia, where one of my students is now a postdoc. Uh, you know, he's he's done some stuff with trying to construct a knowledge base. I think out of it's not films. I think it's it's multimodal articles, and I I like that. Um, but yeah, I think for understanding ads, you just need this like. I mean, a kid wouldn't be able to answer these questions. It wouldn't understand the symbolism in trees just because they haven't, they don't, you know, the media works in a specific way and you kind of have to see, have, it's almost like memes. You have to have seen this meme somewhere to, to know what it means. Um, but there's no knowledge base like that. So I guess our motivation over here was we wanted to see if uh, an existing knowledge base would do anything for us. And if, if so, we would pursue this further, but just kind of gave up at this point because it was, it was not helping that much. And maybe it wasn't helping just because the knowledge base wasn't right, but I guess we weren't ready to invest all that much time in, I mean, we're, we're kind of thinking about this, I guess, you know, what can you learn from watching movies? And we have one project that we're slowly making very slow advances on. Um, but yeah, it's, I agree with all of what's being said. Thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully we didn't interrupt you too much. Oh, no, uh, I mean, it doesn't uh, matter how much of this I get through. I, I agree. I should have said earlier that I'm very happy to be interrupted. Um, yeah, we're also trying to adapt. Uh, even though we launched multiple seminars, it was the best way to get people interact over a, a virtual seminar. We're yeah. still also adapting as well. Let us know uh, which way you feel more comfortable with. Oh. Yeah, just feel free to feel free to stop me uh, whenever. Um, I do probably need to go in twenty three minutes or whatever, but um, we still have plenty of time. Uh, so let me see. So um, this was a nice breaking point. So what we focus on next is more about the relation between. Um, modalities say um, so in the ad space that I could probably skip some of that but the, in the ad space we discovered that the relation between image and text is not as um, as literal is what we call it sometimes as it is in, in kind of captioning data sets so in captioning data sets and even Wikipedia data sets the various channels the question or caption channel and the image channel carry more or less the same information so you have man in black shirt is playing guitar both black shirt and guitar are shown um, you have who's wearing the glasses and man and both glasses and men are shown. In our case, and this is a, a kind of a, an admittedly very hard ad, uh, but this is true in other ads as well, like the winter collection one that I showed. Elements across channels do not align and are connected in a non-literal way. So this is, again, a very complex ad that says they can't afford to wait for evolution. That's what the slogan shows you. And I have to explain this because I didn't get it the first time I saw this. So this dolphin has earphones, and this is something about noise pollution. So, so you have to kind of read the fine print to get it. This is about noise pollution and, uh, right, in the ocean. And it's saying, okay, dolphins can't wait for evolution. They can't wait to, to evolve, uh, to grow earphones. So the image shows earphones and, uh, and dolphins. Of course, earphone will be hard to recognize. Um, the text says evolution. So what's shown and what's, what's what's uh, stated are very disconnected. There's, they, there's still some connection, which is the explanation that I provided, but it's not a, a literal connection. And so to understand, uh, this was kind of a, a first attempt at, at pragmatics, I guess, from the NLP point of view, in the sense that we were trying to analyze not what matches what, but in what way and for what purpose is the text um, chosen or written to complement this ad. Um, and there's a few kind of other works that, it, that, that I've seen that came out after ours. Maybe there's some before too, that I'm not aware of. Um, but I guess I really like this because I've now become more interested in pragmatics than semantics, I guess. I'm more, much more interested in intent and purpose of communication than in just the, the meaning of communication. So in any case, here what we did is we uh, collected this, this very small data set, which we originally meant to just use for evaluation, um, where uh, an image and the corresponding slogan are either parallel, meaning that they are essentially redundant, and you have a bottle of crystal clear water in the text purified drinking water, or you have cases where things are non-parallel, where um, either the image is, is more or less decorative, um, or one modality is ambiguous without the other. Like if you see this, 
I have no idea what it means. If I just see a byte's not right without it, I also have no idea what it means. So one is ambiguous, one modality is ambiguous without the other. Or even I have cases where at the surface they seem opposite, and that's to create meaning in this in this ads case. This taxonomy would be different if you have political articles or memes um, or whatever, but this was a taxonomy we started with. Um, and I'm skipping all the results. I'm just posing this as, as a task. Another thing we, we wanted to examine is how kind of uh, essentially synonyms across um, different meeting spaces. So this is something in our metric learning task that I mentioned where we map images to the corresponding action reason statements. We discovered essentially these, these synonyms and associations between uh, it's all words, but some of the words are more object words of object categories. Other words are more symbolic or, or conceptual or abstract terms from the action reason statements. These are basically synonyms we discovered. So if you want to illustrate it in an ad, if you want to illustrate comfort, these are the objects you would use. If you want to illustrate coolness, these are the objects you would use. And another thing we discovered, which inspired some of my, our more recent work, is um, you could get these associations for free. Um, between regions and a word. So, so this is like results from a detection model, except we never had uh, you know, detection data for Oreos or ketchup or Pepsi or lipstick. These are things in our, these are words in our action reason statements. And uh, by doing this metric learning task, we, we learned to associate um, these regions that are shown in green with these words. And this motivated our follow-up work on uh, trying to detect, trying to, yeah, to, to train object detection models from caption data. Now, the motivation for using caption data is that caption data is something that people might naturally provide when they upload content on the web. Um, what we use here is crowdsource captions, which you cannot think of as being for free. But in general, when I, when I upload a blog of my vacation and I describe it with some sort of text, now that's kind of for free because, or and I guess people now think of this as being unsupervised, although I kind of agree, disagree. There is some human human cost in, in providing this data, but at least it's not you know work for hire like it would be in crowdsourcing. So here we do use crowdsourcing as a first step, uh, meaning we use the data from the Cocoa data set, the captions from the Cocoa data set. And we want to, at training time, um, have captions as input. Uh, then from these captions, we're gonna abstract away. And the most successful method is kind of not something I'm too happy with, but we have others that I'm more happy with. They just don't work as well. Um, we do have this basically classifier, just text only classifier that maps from captions to a list of image level um, object labels. And from these object labels, we have a classic weekly supervised detection task where um, the model has to learn to associate these words that are provided at the image level with specific regions. Um, but the challenge is that captions don't exactly overlap, and in some cases very much don't overlap with the, the list of ground truth objects. So the ground truth objects are person time bottle. This is the image level labels. These are the, you know, we don't train on these, um, but just to see what they look like, these are the, the, the regions, the, the ground truth bounding boxes for tie and person and person, more, more persons. Um, there's probably a bottle somewhere, but the captions don't mention tie, for example. They mention people watch a man delivering a lecture on a screen, large screen showing a person wearing a suit and so on. And so a human can kind of infer that because someone is delivering a lecture and they're wearing a suit, they're probably also wearing a tie. So a human can probably hallucinate this ground truth um, object, but the model, you know, has to work kind of, has to do something, something extra to figure out that from this caption, even though there's no string match with tie, you should still um, assume these captions provide the, the image level label tie. And so we have multiple ways of mapping captions to labels. Um, most of them don't have any, you know, even, even just as, as text labels, most of them don't have any, any actual labels uh, and just rely on like image text matching um, losses. Like we have this glove and learn glove, um, but, our text classifier that does use a small amount of labels and trains a text only classifier. What's interesting is that it only requires like a very small amount of data. So for example, 5% uh, of, I forget what the full amount of data is here, but like if you train 100% versus five, it actually doesn't change the, the recall very much. It just changes the precision a little bit, but even in terms of precision, it doesn't change it all that much. So if you have a very small amount of labels, it's actually better to train this, this text classifier to learn to hallucinate uh, labels from captions. 
Um, this table, which I, I don't care about talking about these results too much if you want to talk about other other things um, in this context, but so the ground truth here is we have ground truth labels at the image level. Uh, we're testing on VOC, on Pascal VOC. Um, so that's the, you know, the, the best result, given that we don't have bounty box uh, labels. If you train on Coco, there's actually more, more data, but of course there's on the main shift, so this is your best result. These are all, if you train on Coco captions, um, and you have to like figure out which objects are mentioned but not present and vice versa. Um, you get 43.1, which is actually not that far from this. This shows you if you use a text classifier that maps captions to labels, but on a different data set, which is Flickr, you actually still get a benefit from it, which is nice. So uh, one of the baselines gets 29.3. This is worse because it's a different data set and the capture is not as good. Um, and but if you do our text classifier, you still get a you still get a boost. So um, I more or less said that. So what we've done more recently is extend this, and and I have one more slide after this, and feel free to stop me. Um, what we've extended this to is being able to do to do uh, scene graph generation with with captions also. Um, the method is is kind of very complex, so I don't really want to talk about it. But one thing we do is is we contextualize you know, meaning of each token in this in this caption through its, you know, through other things in the same phrase. Then we associate word tokens with uh, visual tokens to get an initial scene graph. Then we improve this in various ways. One is we train a sequ sequential model that basically tries to prune like unlikely um, sequences of, of, of tokens. And we have a specific way why we have this in this non-intuitive order. But generally, what I'm interested in is allowing this method to work on much less uh, precise alignments of, of captions and, and, uh, and images. So ideally, I want to be able to learn from people just talking to, say, their kids about the visual environment or just people talking to each other. That's going to be at least 10 years in the future. Um, or captions in newspapers or instructional videos, which we're all excited about, I think. Um, and actually being able to clean up the noise in this, the fact that not all words in the captions, even not all nouns are concrete nouns, not all nouns actually refer to the present environment. Uh, maybe they refer to something that happened in the past or something that will happen in the future. Just ways of, of, of handling the noise in these just co-occurring images and, and text to allow better um, detection. I'll pause here for questions. Thank you, Adriana. Um, I can recall you have uh, um, a time constraint on your side as well, right? Feel sure. free to let us know when is your exact time need to leave so we can yeah. plan ahead. I guess I'll just stick to the 7.45 is 7 my end time. Okay, yeah, so um, we can open the floor for questions from the audiences. Yeah. And one, one comment um, and, and also a, 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 a um, a mention is that we actually, um, Tatia um, here, recently we, we, we have put a paper on archive talking about using caption to train EQA. So we're showing that um, oh, wow. using captions and then uh, synthesize QA pairs from captions. Since you are having like people watch, um, watch a man delivering a lecture on a screen, they essentially can translate into QA pairs who is delivering the lecture uh, people or a man and who are watching the uh, lecture people. And then we're showing that uh, weekly supervised or even um, uh, self-supervised uh, training of the QA from the caption data actually also uh, um, um, having similar observations you are showing there in your paper as well while you are using the caption to do the object detector training. So. Yeah, Great. I may have seen that. I'll uh, I'll look it up. I feel like I've seen something like that, but I don't remember the details, so I'll look it up. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? So uh, in so in this caption, uh, I'm sorry, object detector from captions. Uh, does it make sense to include noisy labels? So for example, in this image. Um, you can extract man and suit from 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 the caption. Then can you learn co-occurrences? Like if there's a suit, there's usually a tie. So 
add that tie label to uh, the ground truth with a and 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 try to learn uh, try to see if that that improves yeah object detection of i guess we haven't tried that um it makes sense i mean i think the model implicitly learns something like that but we haven't right. i guess we haven't tried uh that exactly we did something where we expanded the, the you know even something as silly as you know man versus person that are actually synonyms mm. we uh we, we do have this extended uh vocabulary is using an existing synonym list from another paper right. uh what you're saying i know is not synonyms but we didn't i guess we didn't explicitly try expanding the list through through related uh, words, but but the I guess the learn glove and the um, the so the, the learn glove method is basically an image you know image text matching on this data set, um, and so imagine it learns what are effectively not necessarily synonyms but related words in the, words in this context. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Just a question: Is that the bounding boxes are input to the model? Like they're not. They're not yeah, in this case. We only so, have, so we only have image level labels and, and these image level labels are not even ground truth labels because they need to be predicted from the captions. Okay, so uh, so can uh, uh, like a bonding box for audience be generated as, as the output or like is there a fixed set of? So I guess one thing that's worth mentioning here is I want to operate in an open vocabulary setting, but here we don't. Um, and in fact, I didn't realize that I, my students, when I was talking to them about this, realized that, well, the way you evaluate should at least be in a closed world setting. And I realized that what I was thinking of was actually really hard. And it was essentially an open world, uh, open vocabulary setting. So here what we do is we still only consider the 80 cocoa categories and we just check whether um, those categories are either either can be predicted or, or mentioned. But what I'm showing here, and I should have been clear about distinguishing between this, um, here I'm kind of assuming an open vocabulary setting where I'm highlighting uh, in color all the nouns. So attack and importance are nouns. And in this case, you actually, your model somehow needs to figure out that these should not be modeled as object categories because they're just not visually very concrete. Um, okay. But this is a harder setting that we haven't started tackling yet. Other questions? So when I it comes just, to, sorry, just a I'll short question. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to object detection on images, did you find um, cases where um, the right labels were being predicted for a particular image, but at the wrong locations. Um, we, I would guess that's pretty common. Yeah, what, what we discovered, um, I, I don't have quantitative evidence for that. So what we tried doing at some point was just basically this task, uh, which we did on our ads data set, which was just, we were hoping that just the metric learning uh, objective would give us good localization results or just good detection results, but our results are actually terrible. And I think a huge part of it was just because your, the association bits between some region and some word is generally correct. Doesn't mean that your localization is good. So um, we got a huge boot. Like what I've learned about weekly supervised detection is that you really need to have like good kind of post-processing or something either like re come up with some pseudo boxes and retrain with, with those or, or, or train with those. But localization is really super important, which is actually not all that interesting to me because I'm not, I don't really want perfect detection. I just want kind of correct association between objects and, and words, but um, yeah. Okay, yeah, totally makes sense. Thanks. Thank you. I think I will just conclude today's uh, okay. seminar first. Let's uh, thank our speakers one more time. I kind of hear someone is trying to say or ask a question. Should I miss? Or uh, there was a question, and I guess uh, is it Wei Dong? Are you trying to say something? Because your um, a microphone is cutting off. Uh, sorry about that. No, it okay. was not. 
Well, okay. before you conclude, I guess I just wanted to flash one more thing at you, which is um, we also did some work on trying to understand uh, political leaning, political bias in, in photographs. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. The way, so we have this, this two-stage method where we basically essentially leverage text as an auxiliary modality to learn a essentially reasonable feature extractor for this political bias um, mm -hmm. domain. We also had this result that I kind of like, which is we try to modify photographs of these politicians to be more or less left-leaning or right-leaning. And this is some of the stuff we got. So this was a, a VAE, so results are kind of blurry, but you know, Trump, if you modify it to be left-leaning, becomes demonic. Um, uh -huh. And uh, you know Clinton and, and, and Obama become more le less favorable if you try to map them on the right. This is very much exaggerated. Like we stretch the spectrum very much, and we also have done some stuff with trying to retrieve documents uh, like text based on images and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, again, in this political spectrum, where again image and text are very much not not over uh, not aligned. So we have this metric learning loss where we basically try to. We have these uh, within modality triplet loss constraints and other constraints to map similar things together. So the, the idea is that, um, and I'll, I'll conclude with this. Let me just find that. Um, so a text that talks about a border wall can be illustrated. It can be illustrated with lots of different images. It can be a uh, protest. It can be an immigrant child. It can be IC officers. It can be an actual wall. So, you know, this makes the task of retrieval challenging. And so we have, you know, some some work in that direction. But this student has since graduated. Uh, so that work is on, on hold. OK, just wanted oh, to show you. that too. Thank okay. you. It's fairly yeah. interesting, um, especially the political articles. I know um, in an LP domain, um, people were talking and, and discussing about those, uh, you know, left, right um, sentiment analysis a lot. Yeah, a new in vision domain that um, you got uh, your group is an analyzing images to, to 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 analyze the sentiment from the images. Yeah, yeah. So I guess right, right. Yeah. And also, uh, I I think I would just uh, I I don't know whether you guys have heard about the uh, NFT recently getting crazy uh, oh, what's in NFT? art space. NFT is non fungible tokens. Basically linking um, digital art with blockchain. Okay. So <laughs> it's getting crazy uh, recently. I was also just reading that before getting to your talk. So I was okay. thinking maybe that's something um, could be interesting to explore, especially if you attach semantic meanings into the encoded message that being traded over over a blockchain. Wow, that's. Uh... <laughs> Sounds crazy. I'll have to. I'll have to to check that out. Uh, check check it out. Um, a a digital a digital um uh, um uh, um actually portray, uh, with a certain token that's currently being some of them being traded to six million to eight million dollars each, um, okay. just this several days. So I guess um the computer science and art world, I think AI and security is connecting. And people are trying to cross all the domains. Anyway, just a just a comment. And, yeah, and, thanks. And a uh, I might ask you. Have to ask you for a reference if I can't find that. Um, uh, have I done I'll anything? I'll send you the link. Cool, cool. Yeah. I would appreciate that as well as the the one you mentioned about training VQA from captions. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, sure, definitely. Um, it's on iType, so I will share. Sure, I'll sure. With yeah. you. Or Pratia, if you all, you would like to. Um, since Pratia is the lead author. Uh, if you would like to reach out, feel free as well. So yeah. we haven't done anything with political memes. Uh, we just done political articles. I guess anything mm -hmm. briefer, like briefer pieces of text seem more challenging to me. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll be doing something with that, I guess, but not not just yet. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, point. I think I think the community is like putting more uh, focus on natural images, right? So what you are showing, uh, introducing um, art images and man-made images creations into the into the into the landscape. Well, it, it, yeah. it's a totally different dimension, right? Right. We're, we're talking about totally different dimension of complexities here. Yeah. Than object recognition, attribute recognition, action recognition that people typically talk about. Right. So I can right. see it's so super challenging to deal with. Um, the problem in the, the problems in this space. Uh, and yeah. looking forward to more work from your group coming yeah. out. Uh, we would like to learn. 
And uh, sorry Thank we didn't you. get a chance to talk about uh, your group's work. I guess maybe you can uh, return the favor oh. and give a talk at Pitt. And, oh, I would uh, love to. I would love to. Great. I'll follow up. And uh, I'll follow up with you after the talk. I know you are, you know, bonded to take care of your kid. And yeah. I don't really want to drag you here. I feel so sorry. Oh, no. To, especially he just likes separating to skip his a mom naps from. Days, so, uh, I know. I need to yeah. uh, go to bed not too far in the future. I know, I know. I have two daughters. I totally understand. I my yeah. my my day of work starts from nine nine p.m. So <laughs> sounds familiar. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you again. Great. Thank you very um, much for inviting me. It was it was good seeing everyone. Thanks for so much for listening and for the questions. And uh, I hope we can chat more at conferences, not too far in the future. Totally, totally. Enjoy yeah, and, the and rest definitely of the follow day. up, and we'd love to have you at at Pitt as well. Will do. Great. Tot Definitely. See you. See you. Enjoy. See you. Again. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Um, do we have Stephanie here? I, sorry. Um, I have to. I'm right here. Yeah. Sorry. I. I think. I think. I just realized you are also sitting here for the evaluation, right? Yeah. I, I'm wondering if it's possible for me just to share this. The, 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 the link to the attendees through my mail list yep, that we can so consolidate fun. feedback. Thank you so much for being here. I, uh, it, it's, it's a virtual meeting, so yeah. <laughs> sometimes yeah. that I can hardly track everyone attending during the meeting. Sorry about okay. that. Yeah, I'll go ahead and send you the link. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care. Take care, bye-bye.